In this final lesson on Robert Browning's My Last Duchess, I thought it might be nice to look at the poem using some literary theory. Specifically, I'll be talking about how the ideas of the Russian writer Mikhail Bakhtin are really useful for making sense of the poem. Now, Bakhtin was a literary critic and philosopher whose ideas were little known in the West until the end of his life. Early in his career, he became a victim of Stalin's repressive communist government. Bakhtin and others opposed the atheism that was part of official socialist policy. A lifelong Christian, Bakhtin was sent into exile for his involvement in the underground church. Because of poor health, Bakhtin avoided being sent to the labor camps. Nevertheless, he ended up living far from the centers of Russian academic life, first in Kazakhstan and then in the Republic of Mordovia. Only near the end of his life did he gain some level of fame. Bakhtin's most famous works are Problems of Dostoevsky's Poetics and The Dialogic Imagination. In this lesson, we will focus on just a few key ideas that are particularly helpful. And to get at those ideas, I have a couple of images here. So if you look at the first photo of a stop sign, imagine that you're driving somewhere and you come across a stop sign. You probably wouldn't argue with the stop sign. You would just obey it. Now, of course, you might not stop entirely. You might come to a rolling stop, sometimes called a California stop. But generally speaking, you can't really have a dialogue with a stop sign. In the same way, many texts present just one voice or perspective. You read a novel, and there's only one clear idea or worldview. Bakhtin called such texts monologic. So this is called monologic. And the word monologic comes from mono, meaning one, and logic, meaning reason, or logic, or the word. All right. So in a monologic text, then, the central idea, so if we have a text here, the central idea is always affirmed. Central idea. And we might have other characters in the text. So usually the main character presents the central idea, but we might have other characters. Let's just kind of draw an image of a person here. And let's say this person has other ideas, a, a different ideology. Well. In that case, that ideology is there not so much to counteract the central idea, to present a different perspective, but really just to indicate what this character is like, right? What kind of character traits does this person have? What is their social class? And their viewpoint is not taken all that seriously. By contrast, we also have a text that we might call a dialogic text. And in a dialogic text, we have multiple perspectives uh, that are clashing with each other. And for Bakhtin, the Russian writer Dostoevsky is perhaps the greatest example of somebody who wrote these types of dialogic texts. In his novels, each character tries to develop their own unique perspective, and the author does not judge or limit the expression of that idea. Our second photo presents this nicely. So this is a photo from the impeachment proceedings of uh, for Donald Trump. Uh, this is from 2019, when members of the U.S. House of Representatives were voting about whether to impeach Donald Trump. And what you can see here is much disagreement, uh, lots of different opinions about what is the right decision to make. So a dialogic text, then, is as raucous and unruly as a political debate in a democratic country. And Bakhtin argued that in a dialogic text, these different voices are never truly reconciled in some abstract truth. Even when the characters agree with each other, there's still a slight gap between them. So in Problems of Dostoevsky's Poetics, Bakhtin writes, For it must be emphasized that in Dostoevsky's world, even agreement retains its dialogic character. That is, it never leads to a merging of voices and truths in a single impersonal truth, as occurs in the monologic world. So monologism then, which is a bit of a mouthful, but if we if we take the word monologism, okay, for Bakhtin, this is always a lie, right? It's a it's a type of propaganda. You can probably see why people like Stalin did not like Bakhtin's ideas. 
They felt that only their own ideology mattered. But Bakhtin believed that life is a constant clash of opposing viewpoints. People don't all share the same perspective. They clash with each other. And this is a healthy thing, which is why uh, it's good for people to, to share their ideas and not for one person to shout them all down and say, this is the only way of looking at things. But that might make you think, well, is the dialogic approach then, does this lead to relativism? Right, Relativism is where we have so many perspectives that there's no overarching truth anymore. And Bakhtin says, well, no, that's not the case. We don't have to worry about this. And this is where you can see his Christianity coming into the picture. Because for Dostoevsky, sorry, for Bakhtin, uh, Bakhtin draws attention to how Dostoevsky, his favorite novelist, was drawn to the greater truth expressed by Jesus Christ. Here's a quote. The image of the ideal human being or the image of Christ represents for him, for Dostoevsky, the resolution of ideological quests. So people go on these quests, they try to find out what is the best way of looking at things, and then they come at the end of their quest to Christ. This image or this highest voice must crown the world of voices, must organize and subdue it. And Bakhtin adds that when we engage with the image of Christ, we have to enter into dialogue with it. So we have to ask, what would Jesus do? How do I make sense of the teachings of Jesus? Right, And in this way, uh, we come closer to understanding the highest truth. That is how Bakhtin's Christianity uh, affected the way in which he saw dialogic language. Now, how does all of this then relate to Browning's poem? We've talked quite a bit about the different parts of his poem, and the first thing you might see is that the Duke presents very much a monologic perspective. Okay, so a monologic perspective. He provides us with a dramatic monologue, as we talked about. Uh, He doesn't allow for other voices to speak. And we have to remember that Browning himself is not necessarily monologic, because the Duke does not represent Browning's ideology. The two are kind of in conflict with each other. But the Duke is trying to control the conversation. As we mentioned, he doesn't let others speak. He controls what people say. He's a bit like a ventriloquist, imitating the voices of others, turning their words into his words, rephrasing things, and then also drawing attention to his own command of language. And you can see that in different parts. So if you look at lines two and three, Right? He says, I call that piece a wonder now. So calling something. Uh, a little bit later, he says, I said Fra Pandolf by design. Right, Even quoting himself in a sense. Uh, lines 2 and 13 here. Not the first are you to turn and ask thus. So you said something. I'm going to respond to it, but we never hear your, your actual words. And then a little bit further, perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say Again, he's, he's in a sense quoting here or making up the quote. And if we go further towards the end here, he says, even had you skill in speech, which I have not, etc., etc. Uh, of course, he does have skill in speech, and he's drawing attention to it to say, look, I'm going to show my humility here, ostensibly, but you will never get a chance to speak. All of these things are, are little fragments then. So, It's like he's constantly quoting, and he takes these fragments of speech, which belong to others, and he puts them in his monologic text. They all become part of the same picture. They don't get a chance to speak. Uh, You can compare this, actually, to a kind of painting that is framed. So if he takes a quote from somebody else, and then he frames it with his own ideas, right? It's, it's like he puts it on the wall and says, look, here's the quote. Let me interpret it for you. And that's similar to what he does with the painting of his last duchess. So he's always reframing other people's perspective. The irony here is that the Duke's own conversation is really part of, or his own monologue is really part of a longer conversation. So if we think of the poem itself, there's our poem, right? This poem does not exist in a vacuum. There was probably some previous conversation, and there will be more conversation afterwards. So this little fragment, what looks to us like a fragment, is taken out of something much longer. And the reader's job then is to 
relates the poem, relate what the Duke is saying to the larger conversation, the larger context, history, all of these other kinds of things. And uh, this process of doing all of this is to dialogize the text. That's the word that, um, uh, that Bakhtin would use. It's our job as a reader to dialogize the text, to make it into a conversation again, to relate it back to other forms of speech, and not to be deceived by thinking that the Duke's monologic approach is the only answer. So don't be overwhelmed by it, but speak back to it. Hopefully you found that interesting, and it, it gives you some ideas for how you can take literary theory and apply it to a text, not just for Browning, but for other poems and books as well.